Hi, I'm Mark Moon. I'm the uh, Professor in Chief of the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery here at Baylor College of Medicine and also the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at the Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Today my topic is going to be to discuss the strategic assessment of mitral valve disease. How we as surgeons uh, look at echocardiograms and interpret the results to come up with a treatment plan for our surgical patients. It all began in 1983 when uh, uh, Dr. Alain Campantier was an honored guest speaker at the American Association for Thoracic Surgery when he presented the French Correction, a whole new way to address mitral valve disease. And uh, many of the images I'm showing, or some of them, will be from his uh, most recent summary of reconstructive techniques. We start with the pathophysiological triad. That involves the etiology, which is the cause of the disease, the lesions, which are what results from the disease, and dysfunction, which is what results from the lesions. Um, Carpentier classified mitral regurgitation as one of three different types or mitral valve disease. Number one, normal leaflet motion. That's where you have a dilation of the annulus of the mitral valve pulling the leaflets apart, but they move normally. Two, excessive leaflet motion, which would be either prolapse or rupture of a cord or portion of a leaflet. Three is restricted leaflet or cord motion. 3A is with rheumatic disease, whereas 3B is ischemic disease where the back portion of the heart doesn't work well, the inferior wall, and the posterior leaflet is stiff. So looking at the functional anatomy of the valve, we're going to start with the annulus and work down from there. Lesions of the annulus can include either dilation or calcification. Uh, dilation can be either um, uh, symmetrical, completely dilating the uh, entire posterior portion. The anterior portion usually does not dilate um, uh, because it's fibrosed in that region. There's fibrosis that keeps its structure. It can be asymmetri as uh, asymmetrical dilatation as shown in the uh, right lower bottom uh, if it's ischemia that affects one region more so than another. And the images you can see demonstrate heavy calcification of the annulus in the bottom image and a dilated annulus in the upper image. Here's in a case of a dilated annulus in a 64-year-old man with atrial fibrillation, severe mitral regurgitation, normal leaflets. He underwent simple mitral valve repair with a downsizing band and a maze procedure, which you can see in the post-operative images, completely eliminated his mitral regurgitation. When you do a mitral valve repair, it's generally accepted that some sort of buttressing support should be done uh, to uh, prevent annular dilatation in the future. This can involve a rigid ring um, or a flexible band, and there's also semi-rigid rings and bands. Uh, some sort of support. There are various reasons to use one or the other, which are probably beyond the scope of what I can talk about today. Next, let's look at the leaflets and cordy tendineae. Leaflet lesions include a cleft or tear of the leaflet. They can include vegetations or perforations um, that you can see from endocarditis most often. They can be thickening or commissural fusion, which we might see with rheumatic disease or radiation injury, and calcification, of course. The chordae tendineae can become elongated or rupture. Um, there can also be thickening, fusion, and shortening, as we see with rheumatic disease. Degenerative disease generally involves changes in both the leaflets and the chordae tendineae. Let's first talk about non-pathologic clefts. There are natural clefts between P1 uh, and P2 and between P2 and P3. These are supported by cords. And they func function like commissures to facilitate a wide opening of the valve. Uh, they don't extend to the annulus, though. They're only partially into the leaflet. Then we have pathologic clefts. Here we can see in the upper image an anterior cleft uh, that is generally congenital, um, and also the pathologic cleft in the posterior leaflet you can see uh, below, which is be between uh, P2 and P3 creating severe regurgitation. And you can see the image on the right at the bottom demonstrates us putting a suture in to start the repair and close that cleft. Vegetations or perforations can occur from endocarditis, rarely trauma in the mitral valve position, but here you can see a vegetation that we excised and uh, did a uh, patch reconstruction with a piece of uh, bovine pericardium or na native pericardium. 
Again, with uh, rheumatic disease, we can get thickening or commissural fusion. The left picture demonstrates anterior lateral fusion, uh, or it can occur in both commissures. And uh, if the leaflets are pliable, otherwise, this is a patient we could do a repair in. Uh, there's also uh, techniques for peeling off some rheumatic disease uh, that's not too common in the United States, but we, we do this occasionally in uh, other countries. Here we have a leaflet fibrosis. This is a restricted posterior leaflet. You can see the image on the left, that posterior leaflet doesn't hardly move. And you can see that the uh, anterior leaflet in the middle image of the 3D does not come all the way back down to the bottom annulus to close the regurgitant cavity. So in this patient, you can see the restricted posterior leaflet was thickened, but the anterior leaflet was normal uh, caliber. So what we did was put in a downsizing uh, annuloplasty band and we're able to eliminate the regurgitation. The spectrum of degenerative disease extends from fibroelastic deficiency to fibroelastic deficiency plus, which means normal leaflet size, uh, normal um, uh, scallop sizes, however, rupture cord. Then you get uh, uh, that, uh, as, and as it expands, you get to the fibroelastic deficiency plus. The form thrust involves more than uh, just one segment of the posterior valve, and the Barlow's valve is the most extreme version affecting uh, both the anterior and posterior leaflet. Here's a pre-op image of a flail mitral valve in an 87-year-old gentleman with congestive heart failure and a ruptured P2. You can see the jet is anteriorly directed behind the anterior leaflet. Here, fibroelastic deficiency uh, uh, basic. We do a triangular resection of the area of the ruptured cord and can reconstruct, and we get a um, um, uh, no regurgitation postoperatively, also supported with a 29 millimeter band to prevent any future dilatation of the annulus that could have a, a, uh, be a cause for recurrent regurgitation. Here's a flail P3, similar, 38-year-old gentleman, gentleman. He had uh, anteriorly directed jet, but you can see the 3D image demonstrates that that area of the abnormal leaflet was on the uh, P3, P2 region. And we did a limited triangular resection in this patient and also put a supporting suture, an A3, P3, uh, Gore-Tex suture uh, developed by Alfieri uh, uh, from uh, Portugal and put in a 32 millimeter band to again support the repair with no re residual regurgitation. Here's anterior leaflet prolapse, and this is a bit more complex, uh, and this is the kind of patient that um, a surgeon who's not com comfortable with mitral valve repair um, would consider transferring to a reference center. Here's one of our 54-year-old gentlemen with new onset congestive heart failure, a ruptured cord in the anterior leaflet in the A2. What we did was created an A2 neocord, and we put three of these in through the papillary muscle and then through the uh, leading edge or actually to the coaptation edge of the anterior leaflet where we wanted the valve to coapt. Put again on a supporting band. We did not have to downsize extensively and we had no regurgitation after repair. Here's cordial elongation in an 83-year-old woman with symptomatic mitral regurgitation. Here, this is again P2 prolapse, but this time without rupture. Uh, the cord was stretched. Uh, but there was excessive leaflet tissue, as in uh, FED+. Plus. So what we need to do in this case is decrease the excessive height of the uh, posterior or the middle scallop of the posterior leaflet. Here, we did a quadrangular resection with annular plication, and we're able to downsize that posterior annulus, and uh, P1 and P3 were normal height, so we could do a reconstruction with an annular plication and have no regurgitation. Here's a form thrust patient, a 58-year-old woman with dyspion exertion and palpitations, five-year history of a murmur uh, and mitral valve prolapse, now with significant regurgitation and symptoms. Here we can see on the three-dimensional image uh, that we had a P1 and P2 prolapse with excess width and height, and you can see the intraoperative image of that leaflet. So what we're going to do was not only resect P2, because P1 was still going to be too too big. So what we did was a sliding plasty, cut underneath and unroofed the P1 segment and were able to move it over towards P3 uh, and thereby decrease the height of P1 so that we could reconstruct the leaflet in normal fashion and put on a rigid band.
no regurgitation after the procedure. Here's another form thrust uh, with involvement of P1, P2, and P3. Essentially, you can see on the three-dimensional image to the right, there's a functional double cleft. There's a, the, uh, enlargement of all three leaflet segments. So in this case, we had to do a, a, a bilateral sliding plasty, essentially. We resected P2, did a sliding plasty to P1, a sliding plasty to P3. We're able to bring them back together in the middle without uh, an annular plication, and then put on a 30 millimeter band with no regurgitation postoperatively. And finally, there's the bileaflet Barlow's disease, a 50-year-old uh, woman with uh, congestive heart failure and multiple jets of uh, uh, severe regurgitation and big leaflets throughout. We do an um, uh, intraoperative segmental assessment to assess all the valve segments. Usually, we use P1 as a reference point but because it's usually not affected, but in this patient, all of the segments of the valve were uh, uh, affected. Intraoperatively, we did a triangular P1 resection. We did a P2 sliding plasty, a P2, P3 cleft, a P3 neocord, an A3, P3 alfieri stitch, and uh, had no regurgitation after repair and supported it with a, a 33 millimeter band. It sounds complicated, but it's one technique for each lesion. Postoperatively, we had no regurgitation after that repair, and we're very satisfied with the result. So what about uh, cord and leaflet fibrosis? Here's an example of a leaflet fibrosis and stiffening and calcification. This is a 72-year-old woman with severe peripheral vascular disease, COPD. Her heart function was good, but she had severe pulmonary hypertension, and she was uh, quite frail and debilitated. Leaflet, the capability to repair a mitral valve depends on the pliability of the subvalvular of the leaflets versus rigidity and also the um, involvement of the subvalvular apparatus. You can see on the left, this patient had severe thickening of the cords, so the subvalvular apparatus was calcified and thickened, um, and the leaflets were very rigid. So this, in the likelihood of repair, is not a patient we should repair, and she did very, very well with a mitral valve replacement. So finally, the, or next, the papillary muscles. We can have ruptured posterior medial papillary muscle from an acute myocardial infarction. You can see that papillary muscle moving around with a severe jet of acute regurgitation, making the patient quite sick. Intraortic balloon pump was placed. We were able to reconstruct that um, uh, papillary muscle, uh, putting it back on the left ventricular wall with a good result. And finally, left ventricular wall aneurysms or dyskinesis of the inferior basal wall can cause the regurgitation due to limited motion of the posterior leaflet. Here's a restricted posterior leaflet in the 57-year-old gentleman uh, due to ischemic uh, uh, area in the circumflex. It was not uh, bypassable, so we did a 28-millimeter ischemic mitral regurgitation ring that uh, uh, compensates for the asymmetrical dilatation, and we're able to get an excellent result with long-term no regurgitation. And finally, you can have combinations of lesions. Here's a 76-year-old woman with severe mitral regurgitation who had a P2 prolapse. Um, she had non-bypassable circumflex lesion, uh, so we took her in, did a P2 resection, a 31 millimeter band. But coming off pump, she still had uh, 1 plus uh, to 2 plus mitral regurgitation that I was not happy with. Uh, so uh, I thought there must be something else, and it looked like we got other images, and the inferior basal wall was not functioning well. Uh, so instead of leaving the uh, true-sized flexible band that we put originally just to support the P2 repair, we placed a downsizing 28 millimeter, uh, again, ischemic MR ring uh, to reconstruct the asymmetrical uh, annulus, and she had no regurgitation. We did not have to replace the valve. So the principles for success when analyzing the mitral valve are to, number one, understand the goals of valve assessment, to establish a precise diagnosis preoperative echo, then intraoperative echo, uh, determine the most appropriate treatment option, uh, and consider reference uh, center transfer if it's a complex lesion or one the surgeon in, in your center or you, if you are the surgeon, are not comfortable with. Because almost all uh, degenerative valves should be repaired uh, these days in a reference center. And segmental valve analysis, localize and categorize the dysfunction. For each lesion, do one repair and you do a complete inventory of the specific lesions you plan to repair and address them one by one and it uh, will simplify the procedure. 
So thank you very much. I'm glad you were able to join us today.